give healthy stuff to their kids, right? What happens if you don't eat healthy? And you, you give your kids not healthy stuff because that's just how you eat. But then you decide, I want to change my eating habits. So one day you make quinoa quiche broccoli kugel with no kugel part. And your kid comes home and he's like, what is this? Yeah, that was a nice way of saying it, right? Because he would say something different. Yeah, but he goes, what is this stuff? Mom, dad, what are you doing, right? Do you push it on him? The answer is, sure you do. Don't we all, right? We push on our kids and on our friends the things that we find important to us. Is that right? Something's important to you? You're going to tell it to somebody? No? Yes? Yeah. Right, so why we go ahead, if, if something's important to you, ishlifi malolo. You want to get to know a person, look what they talk about. What do they praise? We naturally praise the things that are important to us. Right? That's normal. We talk about things that are important to us that we like, that we enjoy. So this boy is 13 years old. And his parents become observant, become orthodox, become religious, become from, whichever word we don't have a psychological problem with. And they were advised by their rabbi not to push it on their 13-year-old son. Make sense? As you can imagine, I mean, there's, there's a lot of different symptoms when it comes to this idea. There's something called Balchuva syndrome. Everybody's familiar with Balchuva syndrome? A lot of symptoms to Balchuva syndrome. One of them is the excitement. <laughs> when a person gets involved in something, you get excited about it. When you get excited about it, you talk about it. When you talk about it, it turns other people off like crazy, like back off. Yeah, I, the, if, if they ever see this or hear this, they'll know who I'm talking about. There's a couple who I spoke with somewhere in the world, and they're having a problem with their 13-year-old daughter, that they were becoming more and more observant, and she was becoming less and less interested. And through speaking with them and her, I came out to the understanding, the problem is that you keep calling her neshama. Oh, my little neshama. My little, which means soul for those unfamiliar. Oh, my little neshama. I said, your daughter wants to throw up when she hears the word neshama. Like she just doesn't, like, enough of the word neshama. <laughs> just call her her name, right? Her name happened to be neshama, but the idea is that, no, I'm kidding. But uh, it was Shama. But anyway, whatever her name was. Yeah, it was like Dorothy. I don't know. But, but they kept calling like Neshama. Oh, the Torah says, like, enough. Like, it's nauseating, right? When you talk about So they said, don't push it on him. So this kid, 13 years old, he remained conservative or unaffiliated, right? In other words, unaffiliated. I met him when he was about 18 years old. It wasn't about. He was 18 years old. And guess what? He was still unaffiliated. His family was observant. And you can see from the names of the kids, like the older kids' names, I don't want to say in case somebody, someone might even know who they are, but the older kids' names were like, I'm going to exaggerate a little bit, or like, uh, it doesn't have to be an exaggeration. If this is your name, you're going to be insulted now. But the idea is what, um, anyone named Tom here? Any Toms? Okay, like Tom, Bob's? Any Bob? Tom, Bob, you know, Chris, you know, these are like the older kids' names, you know, uh, Shaniqua and, and uh, what? Ernest, Ernest exactly, and, and Bernard, like those are the older ones. <laughs> the kids were like 80. And the younger kids' names are like Chaya Sarah, Aaron Moshe Yecheskel. Like you see the difference because when they had the kids younger, so they, they, they changed over, so it changed, right? You get the idea. What? No neshama. <laughs> they still don't have any neshama. Anyway, the idea is what? Is that bottom line, shalom, bottom line is that this kid was one of this Bernard's and Ernest's, yeah? And he, till this day, he actually called me last week, called me Erev Shoshana to wish me a Shana Tova. He's probably going to be eating a McDonald's, on, but he wished me a Shana Tova. He's still, you know, not observant. But when I sat with him to speak with him about, let's talk about Judaism and God, I was like, okay, let's talk about Torah Misenai, right? The sign of revelation. And he says, oh, I heard this one already. I said, and? No, I heard it. Okay, so what, so what are you looking for, right? In other words, so what's the problem with it? It's like, has anyone here been to Discovery before? Anyone been to Discovery? Yeah, Discovery, Discovery? Never? Never, never? Gentlemen. Been, been, been? Been? You? You ever been to what? No. What's going to be? Okay, so there's something called Discovery. Aisha Torah has a, a, a seminar called the Discovery Seminar. And it's quite a fascinating seminar. It goes through, how do we know that the Torah came from God? Pretty big question, right? How do we know the Torah came from God? Oh, on the other side of the wall, there's another one. How do you know the Quran came from God? There's a whole, but we, we deal with the Torah one. 
Yeah. Anyway, the bottom line is that so many people go through discovery. I have very, I've been teaching it for about eight years. I can't remember even one person that has had a problem with it. In other words, like there's a problem with it. Meaning they've had a lot of psychological and emotional problems with it, but no intellectual, logical problems with it. You, you understand? Yeah. Go for it. How much do you base um, choosing into an ideology on the codes? Because the codes are just, I think the codes are like straight cool, like seriously amazing. But the question is like, it, it, it is given as a strong selling point for like to prove that this is a divine book. And afterwards I've heard people say like, how much does that, is that really like... Um, Enough. No, is, is that, I'm, I'm missing, I haven't, my brain hasn't worked in the philosophy gym for a while. Just so ESP like, it, I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, watch your language. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, go on, yeah, what are you going to say? Now, how much of it is actually legitimate philosophical ground for proving the veracity of the system? Excellent, that's a very good question. But that would be if we were... Okay, um, that's why I'm happy you're here now. But the idea is what, is that... If it were to be that the whole Discovery Seminar was one class, you'd have a very good point. But it's not, right? The idea is that... Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. I've had a lot of people that have been like, whatever, but oh my gosh, you know, saw the other seven wonders? Oh my gosh, this guy... So my point is, it's when you put a whole picture, it's like you go to a court, right? You go to a court case, and you're on the jury. That's essentially what you're asked to do when you go to this type of Discovery thing. You're asked to be a juror, and you're asked to ask, to figure out, does this make sense, Yeah. Okay, now, are you going to change your life based off it? That's another question that needs to be asked. Should you change your life on it? That's another question. You get it? So in which case, I've yet to find, and even after, I've seen many blogs that speak about, oh, it's, you know, but I've yet to find someone who brought out an actual point. Yeah? The only problem I had with it was, why is it only in English? Oh, I hear that. What, you want it in Spanish? <laughs> what do you prefer? It won't work in Spanish, though. Well, if you speak Spanish, it might. <laughs> why doesn't it work? Why doesn't what work in Hebrew? What are we talking about? Because. Of course it works in Hebrew. It's in Hebrew. But you find the connections in English, right? I'm not sure what you're referring to. It's possible, but I don't know. It, the, the one that I'm familiar with is all in Hebrew. The whole thing's in Hebrew. The, the code is a class. As a class. You know what Bible codes are? You've heard of that before? The idea? There's something called Bible codes. Without getting into it, Bible codes are... Codes that are found in the Bible, right? That, uh, s that are highly unlikely that it could have been put there by a man. That's the, that's the idea. Worthwhile to see it yourself, right? Asia Thor runs this every other Sunday in this building, upstairs, classroom over there. You guys have no excuse because you've been here a long time. So uh, unless you have one, I don't know of it. Why? Oh, that's a good excuse. Okay. I think it's because of me. I wasn't here. But uh, what? every other Sunday, Discovery Seminar. It's like the Discovery Seminar. Every other Sunday here in this building. What? They're not doing it until after Sukkot. But after Sukkot, every other Sunday. Yeah? So now you guys have great excuses, right? But the point is, I'm not saying go to Discovery or not. You should go. That's not my point. My point is, and I'm, I'm basing this whole class off you, is what would we need to hear in order for us to know that something is true? How, how much evidence does one need and what type of evidence does someone need to hear in order for them to go and, let's say, believe in something or even go further and say that they know something? Is that, is that a fair question? Yeah? Now, I, I, we've discussed, and again, but I see new people, so I'll say it again, that even knowledge, even the things you do know or the things you would call you know, you don't really know. In other words, like there's, uh, if I can say, uh, where are you from? You're from Beit Shemesh? Which one? Where were you born? Here. How do you know that? Right, so you don't really know. In other words, it could have been you were born in Jersey or Orlando. Right? They told you you were born in New York. Oh, but there's a certificate. Someone could have written. In other words, you don't know well, what's called knowledge, right? There's a certain level that a person will agree after they have a certain amount of evidence that it becomes, that we call it knowledge. Is that, does that make sense? So don't even get caught up that I have to know something 100% because you don't know anything 100%. And even things that you think you know 100%, you don't even know at all, right? Well, I know that I got 10 fingers. Right? My grandfather used to play this game with me. He messed with my head. 
Right? I told you this game, right? You maybe know it, but you'd say, count, very simple. One, two, three, four, five. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. 6 and 5, 11. Now I was young, right? So I got a little confused. I was like 26. But I was like, Mom! You know, I was like, what happened here? You know? But okay, you could play mind games, you could do shtick, right? But the bottom line is that we hit a certain level of knowledge once there's a certain amount of evidence. So let's be aware of that first of all. And then the next question is, what are you looking for in order to get an answer? And this is where things get emotional. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna hit you where it's gonna bother you the most. And if it doesn't bother you the most, great. And if it does, I said it would. And that's the following idea. There's a question that was asked by Rav Chanan Wasserman, maybe a lot of people have asked it, but Rav Chanan Wasserman of, of blessed memory, a, a student of the Chafetz Chaim, if anyone's heard of the name of the Chafetz Chaim, yeah. Chafetz Chaim was a great, great sage. Uh, he lived from 1839 to 1933 in Radin. And Rav Chanan Wasserman, a student of his, was, died during World War II. He was killed in the Shoah and the Holocaust. He actually could have been saved. He, was, he left. He was, in, in the, in, he was out of it. I think he was in England at the time. Maybe he went to the States. And and he ended up going back because he wanted to be with his students. He didn't want to leave them. That's a whole other question. But anyway, the bottom line is he, he wrote a book called, a number of books. One of them called Kovitz Mamarim. And in the very first piece, very crucial piece to learn inside, the Kovitz Mamarim, very crucial piece to learn inside, he says, he asks a question. I'll start it from the beginning. I was going to go to the end, but I'm too excited to go to the end. How could it be that a 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy have a commandment to know there's a God. Let's take a step back. There's a commandment to know there's a God. Happens to be this debate, Nachmanides, Maimonides, whether there's a commandment to know, because it sounds almost silly. Like, if I know there's a God, you don't have to command me. And if I don't think there's a God, what do I care if there's a commandment? Right? So what does it mean even? Okay, but going according to those that say, welcome. Going according to those that say that there is a commandment. So there's a commandment to know that there's a God. You, you got to know there's a God. Do you know there's a God? How do you know? You're like, well, I don't even know I'm in New York, so how am I going to, right? Okay, so we have a commandment to know. A 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy have an obligation. Now, I want to point something out that you said, just an interesting thing. Well, do you push the religion on a 13-year-old boy? I mean, right? You, no, remember, I said you don't. You, you said you don't. You have to let him see it and let him develop, right? So do you push? It's interesting that, I, 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 no, I think we're confusing things now. I'm going back to my story. Remember, the 13, you have a 13-year-old kid. You become orthodox. Do you push orthodoxy on him or not? Yeah? So do you push it on him? So we said maybe no. It's gradual. If you take a look, Judaism doesn't push it. So why would you? Right? In other words... We're not obligated in mitzvos. A girl only once she's 12 and a boy only once he's 13. You're familiar with that, right? There's something called bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah, yeah? What does bar mitzvah mean? You are now obligated to keep mitzvos. All right, so it means that a 13-year-old boy has an obligation to keep mitzvos. Does a 12-year-old boy have an obligation to keep mitzvos? Okay, so maybe the father has an obligation to teach him. It's called chinuch. But he himself is, doesn't have that obligation, right? Do we get it? Does an 11-year-old girl have that obligation? Same thing, no, right? So it only comes down to that a 13-year-old boy and a 12-year-old girl, the Torah itself didn't obligate to keep mitzvahs until they were like 12 and 13 years. Imagine it would be immediately. Baby comes out of the womb, yeah? You know, they're, they're just, baby's just born, yeah? And then wants to nurse. And about to nurse, and go, no, make a bracha. Right? Make a bracha, right? And the baby turns to the mother, mother, it's Tineas, you know, gets rest, you know. Like, no, we don't, have, okay, but it only starts years later. Why? Because you need to learn it. It needs to be developed. It needs to be nurtured and understood. And then, oh, by the way, you have an obligation. You, you get it? It's just, it's not bam all right away. Same thing, right? Tafasa with the Tafasa. Rosh Hashanah is a time, Yom Kippur, oh, that's right around now, that when a person wants to grow and they want to change, but sometimes they end up taking too much and then they end up burning out, understand that has to be done gradually, right? That's a normal way of life. If you take too much, you will burn out. You will burn out. What does that mean? It means you'll burn out. So the idea is, is back to our, now back to our original thing. A 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy have mitzvos. Oh, by the way, that doesn't mean to say that if a person is getting into Judaism, so they say, oh, well, now I'm starting, so I have 13 years, so I have to keep it. Right? You, know, you have to do it as when, when you're able to do it. But back to my thing. A 12-year-old girl and a 13-year-old boy has an obligation to know there's a God? 
Yeah, you have a child that's 12 or 13? Boy or girl? Only a boy that's uh, how old? A 13-year-old boy. Tell me, does he sit and ponder, you know, the age of the universe? And Right, exactly. He's probably pondering. I was going to say other things, but he's probably not pondering, right? In other words, like 13-year-old boys and 12-year-old girls, what are they thinking about? Don't answer that question. But the bottom line is that Rare is, I mean, they're, they're obligated. Not a, you must know. You must know. You have to know. Okay, what's called knowledge, what's a level, et cetera, but, but you must know. How could you obligate them? So the Chanu says, well, it's quite simple. It's just logic. It's just simple logic. And he's referencing God in particular. But listen to this, God in particular. And he goes and he spells out the idea of first cause, right? I'm sure many of you are familiar with the idea. Everything comes from something. Where did it all come from? It couldn't have come from nothing. It had to come from something. That something couldn't have been finite, because if it was finite, we'd have to ask, where did that come from? Therefore, it had to come from something which was not finite. Another word for not finite is infinite. Infinite means not finite. I'm going to give you another name for that, God. You don't like the name God? Call it Steve, Jesus, Muhammad. Call whatever you want. But the bottom line is, it's infinite. So there. How do we know that there's a God? Simple logic of life that we live. Now we could play a game called philosophy. You like that game? <laughs> well, maybe we are all on a fingernail of a giant monkey. Maybe. Okay, but the bottom line is that you could do that as much as you'd like, and we could give you lots of medication and these wonderful rooms that are padded. And but the bottom line is that people, let's be real. The way you live your life is you live your life based off the statistics, logic, probability, and analysis, more so emotions, but the idea is it's all a mixture of the two of them coming together. If there's no logic or anything in something, why would you go with it? Because someone has swayed you emotionally. But if you stopped and thought for a moment, then you realize, I probably shouldn't be doing this. I'm going to do it anyway, but I probably shouldn't do this. I shouldn't have so much sugar. I'm going to do it anyway, but I know I shouldn't, right? But what I'm saying is, as it comes down to the bottom line, bottom line is a very simple logic of the way you all live our lives called what I like to call practical philosophy. I'm sure there's another fancy word for it. Is, where did this come from? Oh, it just came. You have to do it. What do you mean just came? It had to come from somewhere. No. It's true that it has to come from somewhere, but over billions of years of movements of random particles, it has just come together. Isn't that possible? No, but let's say it is. What are the chances of that happening? One in a patillion. Patillion is a very high number. The other chances are that it was actually designed. Okay, so now back to the idea. It's very simple logic. Where'd it all come from? It couldn't come from nowhere. Any little kid, my, my nine and a half year old when she was six years old told me this. I said to her, how do you know this Hashem? I said, how do you know this God? She goes, well, what is it? What, I don't, what do you, what? So I said, how do you know there's a God? I said, Hashem, how do you know there's Hashem? She goes, well, where did we come from? <laughs> like, what? I was like, we'll talk about it when you're older. Like, you know, you're too young to know that answer, right? But, then, but, but bottom line, it's like a six-year-old can get it, but a 25-year-old can't get it. And Rav Hanan asks, why? Why can't a 25-year-old just get it? Isn't it simple? The answer is simple. Because I want to sleep around with someone else's spouse on Yom Kippur in the Holy of Holies while eating a cheeseburger that I stole without making a blessing. In other words, my emotional wants. I want to live how I want to live, right? I think we all sing, it's my life, it's now or never. I ain't going to live forever, right? So I might as well live on my life, right? So I want to do whatever I want. So you're not going to tell me how I'm going to live my life. But the Torah, uh-oh, the Torah comes along and tells us things we have to do. You mean there's obligations? <laughs> Forget about it. Now I'm not interested in hearing what you have to say. Give me proof. Prove it. Isn't it interesting how we respect other cultures, generally speaking? People, generally, there's always exceptions, but generally speaking, well, not me, so you're part of the exception. Generally speaking, people give unbelievable covered honor, respect, time, thought, reverence to other religions besides their own. Has anyone ever noticed that before? They will listen, they will hear, they'll say, interesting. They'll walk into a church, quiet. Don't say a word, they'll be quiet. Walk into a shul, walk into a synagogue. Hey, hey, what's going on? Hey, how you been? What's going on? You're about to pray. No, that's not a church. Relax. What do you mean? <laughs> Exactly. Go in the church, man. Go, what's up? Are you chilling? Forget. But you go to a shul? What do you mean? It's a base It's the makam of kedushin. the makam of holiness. It's the place where the Lord dwells. But what happens? We listen to the stories of Japan. I remember when I was in, when I was in, uh, I don't remember elementary school. I don't remember high school either. Anyway, 
Let me tell you another story. So, no, I do remember vaguely being in high school and Mr. Abramowitz, that guy was a funny guy. Mr. Abramowitz, I don't think he was trying to be funny, but he was funny. <laughs> Mr. Abramowitz, we were, we, were, uh, we were learning social studies? Is that a thing? What is it about? So that's what it was. We were learning social studies. And again, we were learning about something about the, the, the history of Japan. So everyone knows the history of Japan, that the sun came along and split it, and then the, they had a fight, and one god went to one island, and the other went to another. I don't even know what I'm talking about, right? But I remember when we were learning it, thinking like, who wrote this? Like, where did this come from? Now, you might say the same thing. Who wrote the Torah? Where did this come from? Okay, great question on both accounts. Now let's try to break it down and see. Let's try to break it down and see. Where does the history of Japan come from? There was a guy, there was a guy who, uh, someone was, who was visiting <laughs> uh, Chinatown, visiting Chinatown in New York. Everything's Chinese, everything's like, but he sees one sign that says, Moshe Plotnik's laundromat in the middle of Chinatown. So the guy, is obviously drawn to this. So he walks in and he's looking around and so one like, why is this called Maishi Plotnik? Like, wh wh what's going on here? So he goes to the guy who's behind the counter and he goes, excuse me, sir, if you don't mind me asking, why is this place called Maishi Plotnik? You're in the middle of Chinatown. He goes, oh, everyone asked the same question. Everyone wants to know that question. So he goes, okay, so why? He's like, that is name of owner. Owner name, Maishi Plotnik. He goes, the owner's name is Maishi Plotnik. He goes, yes. He goes, okay, who, who's the owner? He goes, I am the owner. And he's like, are you Jewish? He's like, no. Then why is your name Moshe Plotnik? So he said that when he came over from his hometown, his home country, he came, to, he came to Ellis Island, and they were giving out names. They were asking people names. And the guy in front of him, he said, what's your name? The guy in front of him said, Moshe Plotnik. And when it got to his turn, they said, what's your name? He said, same thing. He said, oh, okay, Moshe Plotnik. Yeah, and they named him. But when you go ahead, look at the history. Look at the history. Some of you will get it next week. Right, but look at the history of what the, Sam Ting. His name was Sam Ting. Get it? Okay, anyway. There you go. Okay, now I'll give you one more because you missed that one. How high is a Chinaman? How high is a Chinaman? You speak English? Oh, hi. How high is a Chinaman? You don't know what? Answer to what? I didn't ask anything. I'm just telling you how high is a Chinaman. Okay, anyway, so moving along. They did, his name is How High. Okay, so moving along, they did what we have is that let's look at the sources, let's look at the origins, let's look at the roots, right? So this guy comes along and says, Japan happened because of this. Who said? Look at the history. What does it come down to? Anyone know Japanese history? Good, neither do I. Bottom line is that we don't know. Some guy came along. What was his name? Sam Ting How High, yeah? And he came along and he made it up. Every religion is like that, every single, except for one. Every, except for one, every religion of the 4,200 known religions today, known religions according to Yahoo's best answers, of the 4,200 religions, and I'm not kidding, that exist today, every one of them claims exactly the same thing. The origin is from either one individual or a very small group of people that have started a story. Judaism is the only religion that says that claims, now you have to wonder, is it true or not? Maybe it was made up, right? But we're at least the only one that claims that it wasn't one individual. The entire Jewish people experienced God speaking to them on Sinai. Now people, if that is true, what more do you need to hear to see that this is true? Is that a good question? The answer is, now you can do whatever the heck you want. If I told you that this happened, but there were no obligations whatsoever, you'd be totally fine with it. Great, cool story. Going to get a cheeseburger. Oh, I forgot to tell you. He also gave us this book that said you can't have a cheeseburger. You're like, Homer, say what? 
They're like, no, you can't have a cheeseburger. Why not? It says in the Torah. Well, who, who would that come from? God. How do, you, how do you know? How do we even know there's a God? Right? Does everybody get it? Yeah. Does everybody get what happens? And I'll tell you, this is like, this happened to me, this exact story played out when I was first started teaching here. When I first started teaching, a, 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 there's a certain track called the Fellowships. There's a, a thing called Fellowships, right? The, the groups come from the States. And there's more of the philosophy track. And I was to be teaching the philosophy track. How do you know there's a God? How did he create the world? Why did he create the world? Pain and suffering. And that's like it goes through that idea. And, and I, I remember the very first group I was having was a Sephardic group. Is anyone here Sephardic? All Ashkenazim. All right. Or embarrassed. Okay. No, come on. You're mi'urav, 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 yeah? You know, your mother's first, parents' first date was a gun to the head, so I hear, right? So anyway, the idea is heard that story two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. In any event, the idea we have is, is uh, Safaradim. Does anybody know anything about Safaradim? Something positive, not negative. Very warm. Very warm. What do you got? Their praying is very nice. Yeah. What else? Slichos. Okay, give me more about like... It's respect for tradition. Right. Anyway, but the idea is, is that you find them, a lot of them are always like saying God's name, like in a positive way. Right? You're like, hey, how are you? They go, ah, shiver, hakel, todara, And everything is about like God, God, God. Right? Like everything is like, like is about, is psukim. And like, I got into a cab. Uh, you know, <laughs> at like 8 o'clock in the morning, and this cab driver is a Sephardic guy. Now, he's not wearing a yarmulke, right? And that's not so uncommon. You find Sephardic Jews, even if they're observant, they don't always wear a kippah. When they go to Beit Knesset, always, and when they say tefilot, and rahamim zilihot, go to alul, and they say everything is like kippah. But when they're, just, when they're just like, they don't always do it. And I sit down, this Sephardic guy, he goes, when did you, he says to me in Hebrew, but he's like, when did you get up this morning? I'm like, what? He's like, when did you get up? I'm like, I don't know, 7 15, you know? He's like, when did you pray? I'm like, 7. 30? You know, he's like, 715? He's like, are you Jewish? I was like, what? He's like, I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning. I wrote a Sefer Torah. I then went to the mikvah. I wrote another one. I then went and learned all of it. I then prayed. I then gave a shiur. And now I come to work. Yeah? I was like, what? It was a chief rabbi. I'm like, what's going on here? You don't know. The Sephardim have a very deep connection, very often you find, with God. And here I am about to teach a hundred Sephardim. It was not a hundred. It was like 60 Sephardim that there's a God. And I went to the guy who was in charge. His name was Rabbi, is, is Rabbi Levy. And I said, Rabbi Levy, I said, what are you doing putting me in front of a bunch of Sephardim and teaching them about God? They all know there's a God. He's like, baloney, they don't know. I'm like, what do you mean? Of course they know. He's like, baloney. I'm like, baloney, that's an Ashkenazic vote. He goes, dafina hamin, they don't know. I said, really? He's going, baklawa, they don't know. So I was like, really, they don't know? He's like, nah, go at them hard. You want to go at them hard. Right, mabruk, you want to go at them hard. I only learned these words recently. <laughs> I love these words. So he goes, what's the other one? Biecha, 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 right? Yeah, so anyway, biecha means old woman in Spanish. Uh, anyway, or if you're Argentinian, it means dude. Okay, in any event, but not to that fellow who was here yesterday, yeah, because he's a little more reserved. In any event, so I said to him, what, I'm going to teach him a God? He said, just go for it, teach him a God. I was like, okay, here we go. I went up, and he's like, go hard, go hard, like hit them hard. I was like, okay, they're not asking us, I'm not going to cry. Go hard. I was like, okay. So I said, I said, I said you know, self-esteem issues. Right? So I'm like, um, okay, I know you guys all know there's a God, so like what, I'm going to prove there's a God to you. And one guy in the back is like, of course we know there's a God. <laughs> the question is that, Ashkenazi boy. And I was like, oh, so you're telling me you know there's a God? He's like, yeah. I was like, you know there's a God? He goes, I know there's a God. I go, yeah, but it's not like he wrote the Torah, right? He goes, of course he wrote the Torah. I said, you're telling me you know there's a God and he wrote the Torah? He goes, yeah. I said, then why don't you follow it? And there's a silence. And he goes, well, how do you know there's a God? <laughs> I was like, let's start. You get it? It only starts when there's obligations. And if someone has something else to say, please speak up. What do we need to hear? What do we need to see? What do we need to experience in order to get something clear? Okay, so this is why one needs to understand that, and, and this is going to, I think you were here, maybe this might be a blast from the past, from like when he first came. 
that we talked about, and you'll definitely remember this, we talked about the idea that we're both made up, our, our body, we, we're made up of two major factors. There's a lot more than this two, but I'm going to focus in on two. One of them is the intellect, and the other is the emotion. We have our intellect, we have our emotion. Now, I already told you the end result. The end result is the fact that I don't want it to be true, therefore I'm going to fight it or it won't be true. But if it's true, it's true. You can't deny the fact something is true. If it's true, you, you can and you will. But, but ultimately, you cannot. In the peripheral, you cannot, right? One cannot deny the reality of something. They are welcome to, but they can't. You get it? So ultimately, what I mean by that is that they themselves will know, and they'll never be happy. Once you get truth that there might be something that you're doing is not truth, you're going to have a very hard time being happy, even if you thought it once was true. Because maybe it's not true. And if it's clearly not true, you, ain't gonna, you get a lot of pleasure. You can enjoy, you can get some pleasures, fleeting pleasures. They'll come and they'll go. But you'll never be satisfied until you get actual clarity on something and you live with it. If you know something but you don't live with it, or even if you live with something but you don't know it, you're never going to feel complete. To quote Renee Zellinger, you complete me. Was that her? Was that Renee Zellinger? That was her. I don't know how to spell it either. And the idea is what is that, is, is that we come down to, we won't be shulling, we won't be complete. Zwellinger. Is she Jewish? She's Sephardi? Anyway, to, 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 oh, she's blonde. She can't be Sephardi. Oh, you can be. She's blonde. You move it off. Anyway, we have what? You got to know. And you got to get away. <laughs> you got to know. And you got to get away. In other words, you have to know something. You have to also you have to feel it. A person will never change their life. <coughs> never. A person will never, never. A person will never change their life based off knowledge alone. A person will never change their life based off knowledge. Knowledge is not what's going to change you. Knowledge is not what we're lacking. Some of us may be. We might be missing certain pieces and certain information that we need to get down to give me a logical understanding of it. But just because you know something doesn't mean you're going to change. <laughs> Case in point, Rosh Hashanah. <laughs> Even those who grew up secular of some sorts, I, I don't know backgrounds here, so uh, therefore if I'm insulting you, you're getting insulted on your own right. I'm, not, I'm just saying something, and you'll take it how you want. But even someone who's very secular, you find very often has a relationship with Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Has anyone ever seen such a thing? I've experienced it. My father was a cantor for 17 years in Connecticut, in Fairfield, Connecticut, in a nursing home. It was awesome. Uh, what was awesome about it? Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, the davening can be quite long. The prayers are quite long. But in a nursing home, we had to be done by 12.30 because they had to eat. So it's great. So the idea is what? Now, I didn't know that, by the way. I thought that was normal. I went to yeshiva, and they're going and going and going. I'm like, what are you people saying? Right? Then I realized that I was off. But what was, what was unbelievable, you see, is that it was a Jewish home for the elderly in Fairfield, Connecticut. Most of the people living there were not observant. They were all Jewish. It's predominantly Jewish. I think all of them were Jewish. But their families would come in Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Right, the high holy days. And let us say, Amen. Right, and they'd have other services and their thing. And the Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh. And the Lord, uh, I remember uh, there was uh, Rabbi Kapnick was his name, Steve Kapnick, still is, by the way. And he used to read from an English thing, which I didn't know was part of the prayer. <laughs> I thought it was just like, oh, the English part he's reading now. Right, and we realized that it was just translating. You know, it's like when you say pray your whole life, but you never know what you're saying. In any event, the idea is what, and he says, um, the, the, he is our molder and we are his vessels. He is our, our shepherd and we are his sheep, right? And I was like, oh, later when I said it, I was like, oh, really? We say that that's all the prayers. But you find so many people are connected to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, even if they're secular. And a lot of people understand the idea of New Year's, of like taking upon something and changing a little bit of growth. How many of us change, though? <laughs> Don't we know we should change? Don't we know we have to change? Don't we know it's the right thing to change? Right? We all, is that right? How high is it, China? Don't we know these things? Hey, we all know these things. But how many of us live year in and year out living exactly the same life we did the year before? How come? Because we kept it in our intellect. We kept it in our knowledge. We didn't transfer it to our emotions. Not only didn't we transfer it to our emotions, our emotions are playing against, against us on the wrong team. So I'm emotionally connected to, let's, let's talk about, a, I, don't, I don't want to say this is silly, but as silly as a New Year's resolution if someone wants to lose weight. 
So as much as one realizes that they shouldn't eat the unhealthy foods, their body craves it because they're so comfortable with it already. That's already like addictive, right? The sugar becomes... To a point, I, I, my wife and I decided this past Passover, we were on a program where it's just absurd how much food they have. Absurd in a, in a wonderful way. And we decided about halfway through, when I could no longer close my pants, that literally, I was just, we just ate so, not we, I was, okay, I'm blaming it on her. I ate so much, but it was her fault. Um, it's the woman you gave me, right? Anyway, so... But we decided that we're not going to have any more sugar, like for the end of Passover. Just drop off the sugar. I remember that first day. And you all, everyone, anyone who's involved in any sort of drugs, like sugar, so you'll know what I mean. Like, it's just like you see sugar. It's just, it's just like, come over here. I heard voices. Then I realized it was my kid saying, come here. I want you. I like, oh, sorry. Like, but he starts talking to you. And as he walked by, I could have swore that like, the cake is like, Mm. <laughs> eat me. I was like, what's going on here? Right? Okay, but the bottom line is, after that, after a couple of days, that I, I was able to do it. Right? Why? You see, I might know something, but I don't feel it. So if I want to feel it, I just got to do something about it. What have I got to do? That's why now we're living in the Aseris Yemei Tshuva. We're now in the 10 days of repentance. In particular, the seven days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, where it's brought down in Jewish law. Even those who are not stringent to do certain things, we give us an example of something called Pas Yisrael, which means Jewish bread. Even those who are not stringent in eating just Jewish bread during the year, they should take upon themselves to eat Jewish bread during the 10 days of repentance. Now, what is Jewish bread? What, what, what am I talking about? Yeah, this is not uh, some sort of wacky custom we have where we convert bread. But rather, Jewish bread means bread that was made by a Jew. You can have bread that's made by a non-Jew and yet it still be kosher as long as there's a mashkiach, there's someone supervising, etc. Has everyone got this idea? A lot of people misunderstand it. They say, oh, you go to like France or different parts of the world, baguettes. So you say like, oh, just have a baguette. It's just a baguette, right? It's kosher, right? It's just a baguette. The answer is, who says it's kosher? Not only is it possible, it's even plausible in European countries that they're, this is going to sound this crazy. What is the pig? The answer is, very likely. <laughs> it's very likely that there's lard that they use in order to go ahead and heat up the ovens when they go ahead and use it. This is not like, oh, come on, what is it, pig? Yes, it's pig. <laughs> yeah, Very likely. But let's even get it to America, where it's less likely, but still possible. If you don't know, it's not, if you don't have someone supervising it, you cannot eat it. It's not kosher. Or even if it is kosher, you don't know, then we can have it. Bread that was made by a non-Jew with supervision of a Jew is kosher, but there are those that are stringent and don't either. They just eat bread that's made from a Jew. There's a concept that people do that. Not everybody does that. As I'll, as chatoy ani masker yom, if it's a chet, I don't hope not, but... I will eat bread that is made by a non-Jew as long as it's supervised by a Jew. But during the 10 days of repentance, one is supposed to go the distance and be a little more stringent. What, what is this like? Some sort of, like, you messing with God? And the answer might be, well, to an extent. But imagine for a moment, you're from the slums. Yeah, you're from the hood. And you, you come, you know, to, to the king. And you stand in front of the king. You're like, sub Honda? How are you doing, homes last? What are you, out of your mind? This is the king of the world. But you go, your majesty, that's how I talk. Brother, that's how I talk. What would the king say if there's really a conversation here? It wouldn't be a conversation. The guy would probably be dead already. But the conversation would be something like, well, when you're in front of me, at least fake that you're not like that. You understand? Don't write in my face be so disrespectful. At least pretend like you're good. God comes and says during these 10 days, at least pretend like you're good. Even if you're not, at least pretend. I'm trying to help you here. I want to give you a good year. So the rest of the year, you, you're kind of not so good. But during the days when I'm judging you, at least pretend like you're good. Because then I'll have something to, to weigh it on and, and help you. If then you're, you're, not, you're not even faking it, then I got a problem. Yeah. Did the rabbi say that this is God's favor? 
this idea, this is a minog from the rabbis. You, you are not obligated to do such a thing. But it's certainly a good idea. Certainly a good idea. It doesn't have to be this. Anything, anything, forget this. Take something and do it. Things that you don't do and normally, you know, maybe I should do, maybe I should do this, but I, I'm not there yet. Yeah, that's the classic excuse, uh, reason. I'm not there yet, yeah? But okay, but you may not be. But let's try it during these five days that are left. Let's take something on. Why? Because then show God. God, I'm, not, I'm really not there, but I want to show you that I'm trying. Now, why does that help? It helps tremendously. Because like we said, we know a lot of things. But we don't necessarily feel those things. How do we get from knowledge to feeling? Experience. I was going to use the word action, but by doing. When you act on something, it becomes part of you, even if you don't want it to. When you say, I really am not ready for this, but I'm going to do it, it starts to become a part of you. For better or worse, even something negative. If you start getting involved in something negative, it starts to become a part of you. And you have to get that out. If you start doing something positive, it starts to become a part of you. And you might want to get that out. So how does one get it from here to here? By doing. These days are the days to do, people. I, I, don't, I, I can't... Re- this is really, if I'm being honest with you, this is really not part... I, I'm just going to tie it in because I want to tie it in. It's like a bar mitzvah speech. You know, I, I'll make it work. But I don't even have to make it work. I just want to tell you. If you are a tzaddik or a rasha, then you're done, right? <laughs> you're already sealed. If you're not, if you're somewhere in between, which I'd like to think of myself as at least somewhere in between. Hopefully it's not. Hopefully a righteous one. But hopefully I'm at least a Bainini, at least somewhere in between. These days, over the next, this is a very serious thing I'm telling you now. Take it or leave it. And unfortunately, I might leave it also. These days are deciding the fate of your year. What is going to happen to you this year? Did anyone get sick this year? Did anyone get strep? Or did anyone get a, a, a knee ache or, or anything? It was decided last Rosh Hashanah. It's deciding right now during these days, are you going to live or die? What kind of life is it going to be? Are you going to have finances? Are you going to have health and prosperity? Or is it going to be maybe not that? It's being decided right now. I think it's a good idea to fake it. <laughs> at, least, at least fake it. Yeah, at least fake it. Okay, so people, let's just try to wrap this whole thing up. What do we need to hear, people, in order to know that something is true? Well, I heard that one already. Well, what's wrong with it? I don't know, but I want to hear something else that I'm not going to care about. What do you want to hear? What do you need to hear? Ultimately, you don't need to hear. You need to feel. You need to feel. How do you feel? By acting. Number one is get get some basic knowledge on paper. Then it makes at least more sense than less. At least more sense than less. If something makes 51% sense, it makes sense to go with it logically. You get it? If something's 51 over 49, it makes sense to go with that. If something's 70, it probably makes more sense. If something's more than that, 90, 199, people, maybe we should be going with that. Oh, but I'm still not going to, so how do you do it? By acting on it. But I don't feel like I want to. Fake it. Fake it till you make it. Because then when a person starts faking it, then they start making it. It starts to become part. Like I said, at least you had the decency to fake. Okay, but then, but then the bottom line is, yeah. when you're trying to you know, take yourself up to God, and you're trying to say, like, so, so isn't there a problem with not being authentic? Listen, you want to know the, uh, the absolute? Don't fake it. Be real about it. <laughs> you're right. I, I'm wrong with how I, I should have started from another angle. People... Okay, I, you know God. But I'm going to begin, and I'm going to be honest about it. I'm going to honestly listen. The altar. What's your name? What do you prefer? What do you What do you go by? Cindy. Okay, Cindy. What's your name? Sarah or something like that. Okay, that doesn't rhyme. Okay, uh, Cindy. Cindy. Let me ask you something. Cindy Tzila. Cindy. Very simple. Number one, you should be honest. You should take something real. You should work on yourself. You should change. But at the very least, say, God, listen. 
I'm not like this. I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm not a good person. I'm a bad person. But you know what? You're in the fields. You're here now. You're right here. I'm going to dress up for you. I'm going to at least give you respect. Now, is that fake? No, that's real. Is it fake that you're dressing up in a suit? Yeah, because you don't dress up in a suit. But for you, I'm going to give you the respect because I understand you deserve that. There's always real even within the fake. You get it? But ultimately, it should be real. But during these times, let me try to push it a little bit. And by the way, when you do that, that's when you're going to start to feel it. This is, this is the classic field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. This is it. You'll remember me when the west wind moves upon the fields of dreams. When you go ahead and you start to do, that's when it starts to have the impact. But be careful what you do. Don't just start doing things that aren't true. Because that will also have an impact on you. A Christian who starts doing things, I, I don't think I've ever spoken as bluntly as I am now, so I apologize for those who are getting offended. I don't mean to offend you. Unless it's good for you to be offended, then I do mean to offend you. But I don't mean to offend you if it's bad. Very simply put, people, and I'm more than happy to hear, what about Revelations 9, 35, and John, or not even that, what about Jeremiah 31? What about Isaiah 53? Okay, we could talk about all those, right? But the bottom line of what I'm saying is, people, it is not real. But there are a lot of people that think it's real. You know why? Because they live with it. Since they live with it, it's gone backwards. I'll end with the following mashal. The Dubna Magid gives a beautiful mashal. And if it's not the Dubna Magid, it's someone else. I think it's the Dubna Magid, though. If you heard this one before, don't be that guy. But you probably have heard it. But it's good to reveal, isn't it? Okay. There was a king, because every analogy has to have a king. And this king started crying because... It's an analogy. Now, so the king was walking in the fields, and he sees in the fields as he's walking along, out of nowhere, he sees an arrow on a tree. But it wasn't just an arrow on a tree. There was a bullseye, and the arrow was bullseye. Boom, right in the middle. And this was like, whoa, impressive. As he walked through the forest, he started to see they're all over the place. There's bullseyes with arrows right in the middle of the bullseyes. And it doesn't matter where. It was, on the, it was on the top of the tree. It's on the bottom of the tree. Everywhere where there was a bullseye, there was an arrow right in the middle of the bullseye. And he does a little investigation. And he finds out who it was. He finds out who it was. He finds it's this nine-year-old kid. So he goes to this kid. He's like, kid, you're in my army. He's like, your majesty, why? He's like, well, I've seen how you shoot. That's amazing. He's like, no, no, your majesty, you don't understand. Like, no. Okay, I know you're young. I know you're scared, but you're in the army. He's like, no, Maddie, please, you don't get, Shh, no, I, I know, don't worry, we'll take care of you. We'll give you everything you need. We'll fill your quiver to the max. Right? We need you in the army. He's like, no, Maddie, please, let me speak. He goes, what, what is it? He goes, you don't get it. I'm not a good archer. I go to the forest, and I just start shooting arrows. And anywhere they land, I draw a bullseye around it. You get it? People... Are we shooting at a target or are we shooting and then making a target? Everybody here? We gotta first see what's the target and then start shooting. Not, I want this to be, now let me build how it's true. Okay, people, it's been a pleasure. See you when I see you. If I don't, then I won't take care and bye bye. Mm-hmm.